something. So we'll go on to something now, which has a more fundamental um, shift of attitude and more foundationally brings together perspectives of data science and system science. Um, that at a more basic level um, challenges um, an absolute faith given to models instead makes it a contingent confidence um, uh, in the sense that it, it views models as, this new method views models as fallible as, uh, and data as fallible and brings them together in a unifying way. Whereas MCMC um, and normally approximate Bayesian computation and normally calibration all lend this great confidence to models. Let's go see this new method. And the method is called particle filtering or, or sequential Monte Carlo methods. Um, uh, this is a, a big element of our canons. It's at once a method that's practical and, um, uh, and has both philosophical um, uh, philosophical implications as well as practical ones. So I'm going to share my screen here. And we'll go into the first of our lectures on this. Um, so um, we've been talking about with calibration, with approximate Bayesian computation, with MCMC, all of those, they differ a lot in some particulars. But they're all methods for assigning, for, for arriving at understanding of, of parameter values in light of data. They take data from the world and they have a model which they trust. They lend great confidence to that model. And, and they try to arrive at parameter assumptions that will best bring the two together. Um, and they do that with different particulars, but that's the basic perspective. They're trying to arrive at estimates of parameters given you know, um, a valid assumption that this is the model that explains that situation out there in the world. Filtering techniques are shown over here on the right-hand side. And, and the term filtering is a bit confusing because it, it shifted, it's, it's used in an engineering sense um, that has some differences from its vernacular sense. What, what, this is, what these techniques are about are sort of reconciling a, um, a view of a, of a model which is not known as, as a sure thing which is evolving stochastically in a way that accommodates many possibilities. It doesn't just trust that your um, predefined governing equations are correct. It, it doesn't just assume that your description of model structure is, is um, it, it, in, or, or your characterization of the model is perfect. Um, it has some variability. And it's trying to reconcile what's coming from that model-based expectation on the one hand with what we're seeing from the world with data on the other. And filtering techniques are all around us. I'd mentioned earlier, they, you know, they form the basis of, um, of the systems that navigate, we navigate with on our smartphones. Uh, when we're walking and we're trying to get to a friend's house or to a restaurant or what have you in a you know, Apple Maps or Google Maps, common filtering is there behind the scenes. Um, when we're flying in a plane from one jurisdiction to another, um, um, the plane is using filtering techniques to, to mesh together its understanding of where it's going to be 30 seconds from now from where GPS tells it's, it's gonna be recognizing that it has imperfect understanding of the aerodynamics and the thrust and the, wind speeds, et cetera, and its measurements from GPS are problematic. And so it meshes them together. 
And indeed, these techniques are central in other areas of dealing with the world, like in robotics and probably autonomous vehicles, although I don't know that for a fact. Uh, so filtering is about something more than parameter inference. When we have a system that's evolving stochastically, that's evolving with some uncertainties, um, what we're trying to arrive at is not just an understanding of parameters, it's an understanding of the underlying situation that has come about. We can with a stochastic model, we can plug in parameter values, but we'll get out a variety of possibilities. And, and filtering is about figuring out which of those possibilities has come about. This is very relevant in the health area, right? I mean, we'll have these models of health systems, but there's a lot of stochastics. A DES model of, of health system functioning is going to have stochastics in it. An ABM model is going to have stochastics in it. Um, even a, a lot of compartmental models used in, um, in, in understanding of infectious diseases are going to have some stochastics. And it's for a good reason, because you know there's a lot of factors that we're not going to be able to perfectly anticipate. And when we have that, if we plug in parameter values, there's a variety of possible outcomes. And, and to understand the situation right now, we want to know which of those situations has come about. The parameters don't cut it. They're not enough to tell us the current situation. And the current situation is important, because if we want to choose interventions that are efficacious. We we'll want to understand the current situation. If, if there are very few, if, if we have more susceptible still around or fewer, and that may differ stochastically um, according to the vagaries of people's behavior change and so on, um, a given intervention may have greater or less effect uh, because with fewer, fewer susceptible still around, um, perhaps uh, engaging in, in, um, in certain spheres, not COVID-19, but in others, you know, engaging in vaccination may not yield nearly as big uh, a gain. Um, uh, whereas if there are still a lot of susceptibles around, it may be you know, quite efficacious. Think uh, outbreak response immunization, for example. Uh, so we're gonna talk here about particle filtering and particle filtering, um, is, uh, is a technique that's designed to move beyond this, um, um, this common dichotomy where we build a model, we use it for insight, and then occasionally we go back and recalibrate it. And instead it's, it's putting into place this system that's it's almost as if it's constantly being recalibrated with data. Um, and, you know, I had from the seat um, one or two days ago, I'd spoken about the fact that models are limited and that, look, even the best evidenced model, the most richly considered model, the most intimately grounded model in terms of uh, evidence from, from the literature, from studies, will grow obsolete. Stochastics cannot be anticipated by the, by the model. That snowmobile rally or the bunch spiel, or you know, the chance that a new variant sweeps in from a different area of the world, different continent, or the fact that you know people's behavior is modified based on some wacko conspiracy theory or what have you. Um, um, these, you know, when it comes to stochastics, even the best models not going to be able to anticipate which way do you know, does the, uh, does the situation go? Um, and, you know, if, if we, um, and, and so models that are playing out, um, as things play out, we may calibrate a model very well to, um, to a situation beforehand, but as time passes, the weeks pass, the months pass, what actually is observed will often diverge notably from what the model expected. And the model assumptions will grow increasingly stale. Um, and so we may calibrate a model early on as best we can to some data. 
And for a while, it may, you know, hold, hold water, but, but guess what? As, as months pass, you know, um, it's, it's increasingly disconnected to, and it's blind to, it has blinders on to what's going on over time. And so, you know, it had expectations when the, uh, as to when peaks occur, that maybe we're grounded early on, but, you know, over time, it, it gets kind of ragged around the edges and it, it's no longer anticipating the timing of peaks and it gets, gets disconnected out here um, as to, to when peak timings are. And it's little or no bearing. Um, so the goal here is to, to have quickly formulated, frequently regrounded dynamic models. It's to move beyond blindfolded models. It's to lend our models eyes so that rather than being built and then just run, all along the way, we have their blindfolds off and they are constantly regrounded in and kept abreast of and kept current with um, and, and changed our understanding of the current situation based on empirical data. That's the idea. Um, so the idea is if we can create these models quickly, then we can reground them over time and do well. And in fact, this is what we did in the COVID-19 pandemic where you know, we have the first models of these sort by, by April, um, and they can be regrounded with evidence on the number of cases and used for, for reporting day in, day out. Um, and the other analogy I'd like to use here is, is like a weather map, right? Um, all of us are likely to be frequent users of, of weather reports. Um, and you know, chances are all of us will look at the weather forecast within the next couple of days here. Um, maybe their weather forecast for this holiday weekend here in Canada. Um, and, uh, and holiday weekend in the US, now that I think about it, um, July 1st and July 4th on the same weekend. Um, and, you know, um, the weather models, they're dynamic models that are used for this. Um, the, our weather apps show results from dynamic models that are prediction, very sophisticated dynamic models. But those dynamic models, probably the same dynamic models that would have existed at the beginning of the year. But you know, it will be a fit of madness to ask about the forecast for this holiday weekend, July 1st to 4th. Um, using the same model that we'll in fact use, but only using data up to the beginning of the year. If we had used that same model, but only informed by data to January 1st, 2022, we'd be in a, a world of hurt, right? It'd be a fool's errand to try to count on weather this weekend using that same model. Why? Because, you know, it, you would have to predict forward a long, long distance, think this, and it will be uninformed by everything else that's happened, by this developing heat dome and by, you know, the vagaries of El Nino or whatever. Um, the, you know, what, what cold fronts swept in unexpectedly from the Arctic or, or what have you. Um, that would that'd be pointless. We, we, we look to the weather forecasts on our weather apps um, and our weather sites, weather channels, to be accurate because the models that they use are kept constantly abreast. And I'm talking about probably several times an hour about what's going on in each given municipality. And they use that information to then project forward. They are being kept abreast every bit along the way and projecting forward in light of that, right? giving their understanding of the current situation in light of that and projecting forward. And that's what we want for our models, do we not? We, we want something where that blindfold has been removed, where we're always you know, monitoring what's going on, what the latest data says, so that when the model looks forward from now, it's, it's with its eyes wide open, right? Um, uh, and, you know, the other analogy I'd like to use here um, um, was really problematic during the, um, uh, during the, uh, the pandemic, but it has to do with, um, uh, with, with 
navigation between different places. So um, many of you are watching this from your homes. Um, and I would say all of us know very well how to get from our homes to our workplaces. Um, we have a very good mental model of that. It's an excellent model. Um, but we would never seek to do that with our eyes closed. And it's not because the model is bad. It's, it's just, it's limited, right? And, and there's lots of other stochastic things that are not accounted for in the model. The vagaries of when, you know, the street light is illuminated to have us cross um, um, a busy street um, or, or the chance events involving construction on the sidewalk or other pedestrians and bicyclists on the sidewalk or, or what have you. Um, uh, we would never try to get to work with our eyes closed. Um, we, we could probably maneuver for 15 seconds with our eyes closed at a time if we were careful, but we'd open them and we'd be regrounded in where we are and we could close them for another 15 seconds. We could open them and regrounded and, and, and go on. Um, but it would be madness and probably fatal madness for many of us to try to get to work you know, with our eyes closed. We, we depend on having our eyes wide open to get to work. Um, uh, and it's not a reflection of having a bad model. It's the reality of just how much empirical data along the way can help even a good model. So this is what we're seeking for. And this is what we get. This is Cheyenne's work, for example, with measles. Um, we're gonna have data informing the model um, to the current present. The model has learned via machine learning um, about this from this data. It's learned what's actually come to be. And having so learned, um, we can then project forward with the model going forward. What has it learned here? It's learned to a degree about parameters. And I'll put a star on that. We'll come back to that point. But what it's particularly learned about is the model state. How many people are, for example, in the likely to be in the susceptible state, the exposed state, the infected state? Or how many people are likely out there to have no suicidal ideation, early stage, um, concrete suicidal ideation, um, uh, you know, out there in the population? Um, how many people are there who may have major depressive disorder but are undiagnosed? It up it uses all this data to learn that, to, to develop a that's a joint distribution over those of that of those of the current possibilities. And it's not putting all its eggs in one basket, it's as a set of possible understandings. And then from that, it's able to understand the likely current situation, project forward. And you can see it does pretty well uh, for a while. But now it's projecting forward into the future. And of course, it doesn't know what's going to happen. And projecting forward from this point, from this month, it can project quite well for the next few years. Just like if you I opened your eyes for you know, 10 seconds and then closed them again, you could walk down that sidewalk for you know, 30 seconds and probably do pretty well. You'd know where to step down from the curb for the, you know, the, the driveway crossing and and um, you know, you'd know, you know the state of the, the light for crossing the street or what have you. But then after a while, it gets fuzzier and fuzzier, right? We get more and more uncertain about where we are exactly. If we pass that shop, you know, if we reach this, are we reaching this corner here? And um, you know, in order to have any confidence about what's coming up, we'd need more data. We need, we'd wanna open our eyes. And that's what happens in these models. They, you know, they get regrounded and then they, they're, they're really good for a while, but you know, the more time that goes on, the more uncertain they are and the more they could use data. But this is projecting forward. And you can see that you can actually predict fairly well where, where outbreaks are. And Shaoyan will talk more about this um, uh, in, in, um, in later today. So I, I think of this as a bit like a GPS also, like, um, uh, there are those on this call probably too young to remember life before GPS um, in your apps, but um, there are some on this call, like myself, who probably well remember life before GPS apps. And, you know, if I were driving to Regina from Saskatoon, I would write down 
the directions, uh, perhaps, and and have a sheet with me, and I would say, you know, come down here and and go on Albert Avenue, you know, the Albert Al Avenue exit, and and you know, travel south to Parliament Ave or or to, and whatever, and turn left, et cetera. Um, it'll be a static plan, and that plan would run into trouble, right? It would sometimes there'd be a street festival on the street I didn't anticipate, and then I'm in a world of hurt. I, my my plan is is it's jeopardized. I, I can't take my plan anymore. What am I going to do? Um, and I, I've got to go figure it out on my own. And maybe I drag out a map and look. Um, but there's no capacity. There was brittle, right? Like it was a fragile plan. It was a static, fragile plan. Um, but what a GPS gives us, of course, is if we miss the Albert Street exit because of a street fair that, that's blocking it, um, it will reroute us. It will give new recommendations. And it's like that with our models. We can be rerouted over time. Um, uh, and yeah, I know about GPS. It goes way back then, but it was, it was, I think, the first launch of it. A lot of it was restricted to military use. And um, I was looking into this in the late 80s and early 90s uh, for civilian use. And it was uh, much more problematic there because uh, uh, signals were were actually uh, interfering with, so it was used you know, for military with high precision and they actually added noise or added signals to make it less accurate for civilian use. And certainly smartphones were not around then, I can tell you that. Um, so, um, so in any case, the, the point here is that with a GPS compared to, um, to written instructions, we have this way of constantly getting regrounded and reconnected. It knows where we are and reroutes us based on where we are. And that's what it's like with these models. We can, we can get reconnected. Now, the, the methods for doing this actually go back a long distance. The Kalman filter came about in about 1960 and uh, through Rudolf Kalman, uh, um, who did a lot of wonderful work um, in this area and it been canonized. And, and this provides, um, uh, the sorts of methods we have in our very smartphones now um, and that are built in when we're using these sort of apps. Um, but um, those sorts of methods are really designed for things like airplanes and cars and missiles and spacecraft and so on, um, where you need like second by second guidance. Um, uh, in robotics, they were increasingly supplanted by methods that are computationally more demanding, but much richer, much less restrictive in their assumptions. Common filtering assumes, particularly for um, to be optimal, it assumes Gaussian, so normally distributed noise um, and differentiable systems. For some, that will be a meaningful statement. And, and particle filtering um, has, has much more, much less restrictive assumptions. Um, uh, it's much better suited for nonlinear models. It doesn't assume normal distributions. Um, uh, it, it has uh, posterior distributions. They can be computed over states um, at a certain point of time. It's an entire distribution instead of a single most maximum likelihood entropy, or excuse me, maximum likelihood expectation um, point. Um, it, it common filtering estimates the most likely position we're at. Particle filtering has a joint distribution of possibilities. Distribution, sort of competing hypotheses. Some think there's more people susceptible and fewer people infected, and almost no one recovered. Another one will say, no, you know, you're out to lunch. There's actually a lot fewer susceptibles than you think. There's quite a few exposed and infectives and a moderate number of recovered. And others will say, no, I disagree. There's few recovered, but there's quite a few infectives that's true and quite a few exposed and, and uh, still quite a few uh, susceptibles. And they'll all have different, different interpretations of the situation. There's no, importantly, com uh, particle filtering can be used with uh, in principle, it can be used with agent-based methods and um, discrete event simulation methods, et cetera. 
it's higher computational burden, but common filtering, although typically quite adequate. We used it daily for all these, uh, um, all these different needs here during the pandemic um, under contract. And, um, uh, and as we'll see, it, it does involve any one interpretation being updated as to its substance, just as to the amount of credibility we lend to it. Um, okay, so we talked about MCMC, which is all about sampling parameters. Particle filtering is all about sampling the, 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 the underlying state of the system, of a stochastic system. MCMC is for deterministic systems. Particle filtering is for stochastic systems. And here, we're going to be estimating the current state of that system. The idea is, look, um, with a stochastic system, even if you plug in parameter values, it has different possibilities. Um, and we're going to be re-estimating it, right? Like, there's different underlying possibilities of what has come to be, even given parameter values. And we are re-estimating the state of the system to know what has come to be so that we can project forward. And that's the idea. Um, so, you know, for COVID-19, for example, our, our, our models uh, made use of uh, health system data, such as that shown here on a daily basis and wastewater data whenever it was available. They regrounded the estimates and then they project forward, um, much as a weather model takes into account the wind, you know, the measured wind at, you know, the Saskatoon airport and the amount of um, sunlight and the amount of rain that's been recorded and the temperature and a bunch of areas of the city, et cetera. And, and you know, re-estimates what it thinks is going on right now and project, is able to then project it forward. So, you know, this is, um, um, a uh, it's slightly outdated, but it's a it's a vision of our of our um, uh, 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 our model used for particle filtering with COVID nineteen and and what you'll see here um, I'll come back to this so I want you to be able to parse it um, uh, here we have a pathway of um, uh, sort of classic um, uh, Frank COVID nineteen so we have um, uh, exposed individuals, infectious individuals, early stage symptoms, late stage symptoms, and recovered. And the notable thing here is that early stage symptom people are, are not in a situation where they need to go to the hospital. They're early stage. It remains mild for everyone there but um, who's in the state. But, but after a while, they may develop serious enough symptoms. They go to the ICU or go to the non-ICU in the hospital or die. And then some people, um, about 40% of the overall population, higher for lower, in, lower age groups, um, go uh, what's sometimes called an asymptomatic, but better term would be posy-symptomatic or oligosymptomatic route, where they basically don't develop symptoms enough to be concerned, to be aware that they're sick in any serious way. They may think they have a, you know, an allergy, snow mold allergy, or what have you. They may they may, um, uh, they may just think they, you know, they've got some dust or it's just a bit of morning sniffles or what have you. Um, and so that's, that's this route. And these are diagnosed people. Um, we won't go into this in detail, um, but uh, I, I'm gonna come back to this model several times. And for those of mathematical inclination, of course, there's a set of differential equations underlying it, which, you know, are, are implicit here. It's uh, um, in a, in a package like Venom, there or, or or any logic, they're kind of uh, they're kind of hidden. Okay, so a few key work facts about how particle filtering works. Particle filtering can be understood at at least four different levels. Four different levels. At at the highest level, it's kind of philosophically uh, a level down from that intuition. Uh, a level down from that, the mathematics of the distributions. A level down from that, the details of the sampling from that distributions. All of those have a certain Zen associated with them, a yoga associated with them about how the logic of how the system works um, at that level. And I wanna make sure 
that everyone here carries away at least a few first few levels of that. Um, we're not going to have time to go into the last two levels in detail, but I can refer you and I will refer you to material where I cover that in detail. It's outside the scope of this, this, uh, this boot camp. But the first few levels, the first two levels definitely are things you should be able to get. And I hope in my lead up to this, you're developing some increasing understanding of the philosophy here. The philosophy here is don't lend a model all your credence. Take a model um, together with incoming data in a way that constantly regrounds that model is going to give a much more reliable foundation for knowledge. Build into your model humility, um, not so much that it's debilitated by lack of self-efficacy, but enough humility to be open to being told to, to discovering that it's wrong and correcting itself. Um, that's kind of the philosophical level here. Let's talk though about that next level down of how it works, okay? Um, so this simulation model has stochastic processes. It has some uncertainties associated with it. Maybe it's contact rates and how they're evolving over time. Maybe it's vagaries of how many people exactly are getting infected per unit time. Maybe on average it's something, but small numbers, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Um, um, maybe it's something to do with the details of the, um, the, the case finding, how effective that is in finding people. Um, uh, the simulation model um, will run in normal levels, normal ways between prediction steps for each particle, I'll come back to it, for each sample. Um, but when we see observations, it's just like us walking down that sidewalk with our eyes closed. When we open our eyes, our understanding will be corrected by where we see we are. We'll say, oh, we're three meters ahead of where I thought I was, or we're, um, we're, we're not even where, nearly where I thought I was, um, you know, based on having my eyes closed. Um, so when we, when we have observations from the world, like opening our eyes when we've been walking blindfolded, suddenly it leads us to kind of correct our understanding of where we are, right? Um, and so it is with particle filtering. Um, but here we're going to be capturing that correction. Not, it's not that we update our understanding of the world in, in some monolithic way. Instead, what's happening is we're going to have circulating in the model, in the particle filter, many competing hypotheses for what's going on in the world. There'll be as it were, imagine walking down the sidewalk, there'll be some hypotheses that say, oh, I'm actually here, or I'm actually there, you know, um, based on um, your understanding. There'll be many different hypotheses. And when you open your, your, your eyes, you know, certain hypotheses will be um, given much more credence. So imagine you open your eyes, it's, but imagine it's dark out. And so you're still not quite sure exactly where you are, but certain of those hypotheses are ruled out. You know, clearly you could see, oh, we're quite far from that lighted storefront or, or you know, um, I can make out there's a street just ahead, so I must be at this intersection or that intersection. And a couple of hypotheses are suddenly boosted, you know, in, in their understanding. So uh, there's going to be competing jockeying hypotheses, each, each jockeying to explain the data here. Uh, and we call these hypotheses samples or particles. Each particle contains a complete hypothesis about the state of the model. Each, each of these particles, each of these hypotheses has some complete belief about the world. It says there's a certain number of people here, 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 a certain number of people here at any one time. Each hypothesis says, this is the way things are right now. Um, this number of people here at each of these places. So each of them has a mathematical, we call it a state vector. It is, it says this many people here, this many people here, this many people here, this many people here, et cetera. Each hypothesis was right now, that's what's the case. And, but they disagree. Some hypotheses say there's, again, there's more 
oh, there's more susceptible. Some say, no, there's fewer susceptible, but more infective, or whatever. They disagree in their particulars. Each particle reflects a competing hypothesis as to the value of the state. And, but not all of these hypotheses are born equal, or not all of them are equal. Specifically, some of them are more credible. Some are more consistent with what we observe from the world. Some are predicting things about what we should see about the world that have higher fidelity to the world than others. And so each of these hypotheses, each of these particles um, has different credibility because of that. And we associate that credibility with what's called a weight, okay? Um, there's a weight of it. Something with a higher weight is more credible, has, carries more, more weight. It, it has more credibility associated with something with a lower weight. And the weights are determined by how consistent they are with the observed data. Um, so some of these hypotheses predict things that are totally at odds with the data, that hold no water. And those, those hypotheses will have low weight. Some, some hypotheses are just bang on and predicting things that are at least consistent with the data. They say, yeah, you know, that data is quite likely given my state. And those will tend to have higher weights. And guess what? There's a survival of the fittest of these particles. The ones that are higher weight will tend to be fruitful and multiply. That is the ones that are more consistent with the data will tend to be fruitful and multiply. And the ones that are less consistent with the data Will, will tend to die out. There'll be a, a, a grim reaper that goes through and, you know, which um, clears out the ones that are less consistent in a, in a process called resampling and which boosts the ones that are, that are more consistent with the observations. So we have these jockeying hypotheses competing to explain the data. Um, and, um, when a new observation comes in, there's an accountant having, that has to happen. There's kind of a, a, a judgment day where all these particles are held up for what their expectations are against the new data that's been observed and their weights are up, up weighted or down weighted by how, how accurate their predictions are of what they expect to see right now compared to what's actually observed. These are the core intuitions here. If you get this much, you know, you, you've gotten actually a lot. Um, um, and it's, per, it's performed recursively. I'll get to the question in the chat in just a second. Um, it, and so rather than re-estimating things from the start when new data comes in, we update our weights when the new data comes in. So the question, if particle MCMC model uh, is superior technique with their grounding, then do people still use MCMC and why would they use it for there's a better model? Uh, good question. And um, at the cost of flashing some screens here in a disorienting way, I'm just gonna go back uh, a, few, um, uh, a few things here. So MCMC is a technique for, for parameter inference. What we're talking about right now is the technique for latent state inference. When it comes to particle MCMC, we'll be doing both. Um, Particle MCMC is not needed for deterministic systems. If you have a deterministic system, MCMC is, is your ticket. Why? Because you don't need latent state inference because if you plug in the values of the parameters, it totally dictates what the state is at a given time. You plug in parameter values to a deterministic model, you run it and you get out a certain value, defined single value at a given time. There's no latent state to infer. There's no, you know, welter of possibilities to that can obtain in a deterministic model. You plug in your parameters and you get out a result. And so MCMC is still tool of choice for these. But um, if you're dealing with a stochastic system and you want to estimate parameter values and the latent state, then particle MCMC is your tool of choice. Um, uh, I don't know if that's that's helpful, but you know, um, uh, for for a system where we have stochastics, we have a task 
that goes beyond estimating parameters. Because again, we don't have, like even, even the best model of a stochastic system, a stochastic model won't know which way the stochastics went. It won't know when the outbreak started because that depends on stochastics. It, not, it might not know, you know, about the snowmobile rally or the bond spiel or that chance event where someone went to the Jack's, you know, uh, dance club and, and spread infection or what have you. Won't know when that new variant spread, you know, swept in. And, um, and so when you're dealing with a stochastic system, um, you know, uh, the, the best determine, uh, you know, you, you need something that will clue you in to which way the stochastics have gone, um, like here, um, which way these, these ch chance events uh, came in. And so then you need this extra state inference um, uh, that's needed. But if you want to do parameter inference of static parameters, particle and CMC is good. As you'll see, within latent state inference, we can still infer changing parameters, parameters that are evolving stochastically. But for static parameters, um, you have a need for static parameter inference in latent state than you do in particle and CMC. Yeah. And we'll be covering that tomorrow. Okay. Um, so um, uh, here we're predominantly emphasizing latent state inference, recognizing that may include some evolving parameters, stochastically evolving parameters. So here, remember that we have these jockeying hypotheses. The model is, is like this. And, and if you understand, if, if, you, if you get this basic intuition again, you'll be really far ahead. Think of our simulation model as no longer just running you know, from start to finish with any one state at a given time. Think of it as hundreds of thousands of hypotheses, of competing hypotheses as to what's going on in the world running together. Um, they're all at the same time and they're all running forward at the same time. And when new observations come in, there's this judgment day, there's this, there's this, you know, splaining that has to happen. This, this um, accounting, each of them is called to account to the, um, to the observations in the world. The ones that are, that are high performing, that are, are saying things that make sense, that match up closely against the world are given more credibility. Ones without, that are not, that are consistently out to lunch, that are saying things that are just completely, you know, inconsistent with the data will have very, very low weights. And sometimes there'll be this Green Reaper that, that, that has the ones that are highly successful propagated and the ones that are, are, are low, have low weight disappearing. Um, so think of this as running like hundreds of thousands of particles at the same time, hundreds of thousands of these competing hypotheses. And it's when observations happen that it totally changes the balance of those hypotheses. Now, um, I want to go one level deeper than this, though. Okay, um, um, so, so uh, uh, one level deeper than this intuition I've had, and uh, I, it's still going to be very intuitionistic, but it will build up m deeper grounded intuition. And these intuitions are key for actually working with 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 these models. Um, if you can have these intuitions, it's a real aid in interpreting why is the model not interpreting things. It's, it's not just a nicety. It's not just a matter of not understanding the real essence. No, 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 these are really useful things. Okay, so think again, we have a model and it's evolving stochastically. There's some stochastics. The stochastics represent its humility, ladies and gentlemen, speaking at a philosophical level. It represents the fact that we're not really sure exactly all the details of how the model will evolve. Um, um, it, these are aspects of, of, of uh, we, we want the model to, to admit a possibility, a, a broader set of possibilities. Um, we're subscript the model by these parameters. So it's like each of these, it's like there's many layers of S, 100,000, 200,000 layers of S. You know, each particle has a different version of what it thinks S is, a particular value for it. Each particle is a particular value at a particular time. 
Don't get me wrong, but but um, they have different values. Some particles think they're very few. Some think there's a high number. Think think there's a middle number, etc. Um, and I say hundreds of thousands, but these days we commonly do hundreds of thousands. Um, um, and um, and then between observations, all these particles are just like solitudes. They all run forward according to the normal rules of, of this model. Just run forward, just as if it was this sort of model. And each particle is like, you know, it's a certain value here and it, it just runs forward until the next observation. Um, it just says the logical consequences of that carried forward. You know, it has momentum and it carries it forward. Great. Each particle just moves forward. But then at, and, and the particle weights remain unchanged. We have no reason to, to lend more credence to or less credence to the particle between those observations. But then at observation points, we have this, this accounting that goes on. Each hypothesis is, again, judged according to the empirical data. And how is it judged? How, how does that take place? And, and I want you to understand this, because again, this, this is really useful to understand. Each particle believes hard. Each particle does not change its mind. No particle changes its mind based on the observation. And you may say, well, well then how does the model adjust its belief? Ah, what happens is, the credibility of different particles changes. And we believe some particles now a lot more than others. It isn't that any one particle ha has, has come clean and said, okay, I was wrong. You know, I, um, I was off. Now I believe something different. No, no, no. Each particle still believes what it believes. It's just that we give a lot more credence to the ones that are, that are, that are consistent with this data. Um, and so what we change is the weights of the particle. Remember, the weight captures credence, captures credibility of a particle. A particle with a higher weight is viewed as more credible. And, and so we upweight the particles that are consistent with the data and downweight the particles that are not. So we actually multiply the particle weight by the likelihood for that particle, given its state. Remember, each particle has a certain value for each of these these stocks at a given time. And it has a, and, and given that state, it, it assesses there being a certain likelihood of observing different things in the world. If, if this is a particle where, you know, it has a lot of susceptible still, quite a few exposed and, and some infectives, and um, it's asked, you know, what's its likelihood of observing um, uh, zero New and uh, new uh, new infections occurring, for example, to, to simplify this example, um, it would say that's not very likely. Um, that would have a very low likelihood. If that's what's actually seen empirically, if somehow we magically knew the number of new infections, um, it would it would be downweighted because that's very unlikely given it. If it said if if there was data from the world that said there's actually a modest number of new infections, it would say, oh yeah, it's it's upweighted because it's very consistent. If there's a massive number of new infections, it would say, oh, I didn't think there'd be that many. And so its weight would, would go down. We multiply it by the likelihood. So the likelihood reflects how likely is this observation given that particle state? Mm. Um, and so if this, is an, if this is empirical data from the world that's highly likely given that what that particle thinks is the case in the world right now, its weight will go up. By contrast, if, if what we observe is very unlikely, given what the particle thinks is going on in the world, this, what we observe from the world is very unlikely, its weight will be really downloaded, or really downloaded. It'll be really down, downweighted. It'll be much lower weight. Now, I, I, I want to get more precise about this weight because I've been, I've been trying to explain it in intuition, but there's actually a more crisper way to say it. Ladies and gentlemen, a weight is an important sampling weight. And, and for some of you, a light bulb may go off. And for others, that will be an opaque statement. So um, with an eye towards the latter, particularly, I just want to explain. So let's suppose one particle has a weight of 
And another particle is a weight of 0.25, half of that. What that's saying is that a particle of 0.5 is actually represented in the distribution twice as much as one with a weight of 0.25. And what's, what's going to happen is we're not going to deal with the particles themselves. We're going to deal with drawing from part. We're never going to sort of just go down one by one by one for the particles to compute some quantity. No, 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 no. We're going to draw from the particles or the probability of drawing each according to its weight. So it's something that has a weight of 0.5 will be drawn with a probability twice that of something with a, prob uh, a weight of 0.25. Mm. So the weight indicates how frequent this particle is in the distribution of particles, the importance distribution of particles. I'll get to the question in just a second here in the chat. Um, so the weight encodes the frequency of the particle in this distribution of particles, this importance distribution of particles. Not all particles are, are equal, I said. Um, particles with, uh, if a particle is weighed twice that of another, it'll be twice as represented when we, when we wanna take a mean over particles or when you wanna plot out the distribution over particles be twice as represented. So weight represents how common it is in the distribution. Um, and the other thing I wanna say is that there's this resampling process whereby um, particles that have high weights will be multiplied. This will occur when the, the so-called effective sample size is too low. I mean, basically it means we're, we're dragging around too many particles that have really low weights is, is a common case. Um, that occurs. If we're, if, you know, 90% of the particles are really low weights, 10% have, have the, the vast majority of the weights, there's, there's some redistribution that needs to occur here. The particles with high weights will be multiplied, they'll be cloned, and there'll be lots of them. And particles with medium weights, well, be, there'll be some of those represented in the distribution, but those with low weights will tend to disappear. So there's this survival of the fittest, right? There's this kind of resampling. Um, particles with high weights will reproduce, those with low weights will disappear. And, and all of these will then be given a rate of one, a weight of one. And, and then they'll evolve. Now you may be excused for saying, well, wait a minute, if we clone these particles, I mean, each particle is cloned. I mean, like, what good is that? Then we have all these clone particles that have exactly the same belief. And that's not, um, you're, it's good to think critically, but you have to remember this is a stochastic model. So even if things like right now at this time are all the same, as we run the model over the next little bit, oh, they're all diverged because of chance events that are different for the different particles. So those particles which started the same will soon have different beliefs about the world because they've evolved in different in, in different stochastic ways. Um, and they'll each have a different belief. Some will think, oh, the outbreak is starting. We, you know, um, uh, it's, it's gonna be taking off. Others will say, no, it's quiescent. Even if they started with the same initial state next little bit, some will think, oh, an outbreak's coming. Some will think, nope, it's, it's, it's not. We're all, we're all fine and dandy. Some will think, you know, oh man, um, there's, there's some hidden infectives here already and, and we better tighten our seatbelts because we're gonna get some outbreaks soon or what have you. And, um, and these particles will have different interpretations. Um, okay, so a question, um, um, basic question. The structure, ah, good question. Structure of the model remains the same. Can it also change? Um, so one thing for simplicity I've not talked about is how these Bayesian methods can handle, can handle um, uh, different structures. Um, normally, I, I haven't seen this particle filtering, to be honest. Um, um, I think you, you could in fact have this for particle filtering um, uh, would be my understanding. And here the particle would carry not just the state of the state of all those stocks, all those 
compartments, but it would also um, understand the uh, the associated model with, that's associated with that. And so some particles would be hewing to a different model. Where it gets more complicated is um, uh, if, and, and this would have to be thought through, if those models have totally different, um, it might be okay, totally different state structure, um, not just, you know, if they have different rules governing it, I think that's fine. But if they have totally different numbers of states, there might be some difference, but I actually think probably it would be just fine, actually. I, I don't see a problem there. I, it's interesting. I haven't seen that. But where this does come in, Genevieve, is, and it's a great, great, great question, where this comes in uh, also is people use MCMC with different models. So there, there remember, remember MCMC is sampling from different alternative hypotheses about parameter values, right? And, and we're, 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 we're sort of generating those that are more plausible more frequently and, and less plausible less frequently. That was what MCMC was about. And people do MCMC sometimes selecting not just parameter values, but models. And so it's like we sample from models and parameters that are more common and less from models and parameters that are less common. And so you can actually have model selection that are different. The, model, the models aren't evolving, but they are, they are um, being sampled for plausibility by MCMC. Um, where that gets really complicated is if the models have different parameter spaces. So like some models have more parameters than others, then it gets, there's a thing called reversible jump markup chain Monte Carlo. And it's, th these are very sophisticated things. Um, uh, they can be done, but they're, they're you know, pretty, uh, uh, pretty sophisticated things. With particle filtering, normally the structure of the model is not itself evolving, um, but you might be able to have particles that uh, hew to different models. I think this is a really interesting question. One thing that you know will get you a bit closer to what you're asked about the structure evolving is, remember I said you could sample for different um, uh, evolving parameter values, um, meaning um, not static parameters, but you could, as part of model latent state, the part of the, the state of the system um, might be the value of an evolving parameter. And that parameter might characterize, for example, um, the, um, might limit how many people go down certain flows to other stocks, other state variables, other compartments in a way that would effectively turn off those compartments, you know, like um, maybe it's waning of immunity, for example, and it would enable or disable waning of immunity in some ways. And that would be a little bit like changing the structure of the model by adjusting the parameter value. Um, so that's a very interesting idea. And um, I, I wanna uh, think more about that, but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's intriguing. And in general, these Bayesian methods do admit for this. The question is how sophisticated does your approach have to be to take it into account? Like how much custom um, mechanism do you need to, to take it into account? Um, or how straightforward is it once you get to selecting models? It can be straightforward in some cases, like with MCMC, if you have the same number of parameters on the model, but it can become quite complex otherwise. And in general, it's good to have a statistician to talk to. I have, I have my resident statistician who's like, like the god of the goddess of statistics, uh, Zhu Shen Liu, um, and uh, she's she's just awesome, and um, she helps me stay on the straight and narrow in these things. Um, um, been very patient over the years, and um, has enabled much of our much of our work. Um, uh, okay, so. Um, what we're talking about here can be applied for a wide variety of models and, and compartmental models are, are straightforward. And, and, and it, what, what bears noting is that because we're comparing at observations, we're comparing what each particle expects should be the case with what the observed data is the case by applying the likelihood functions. 
you know, all the data we're comparing with from the world, we kind of need something in the model that corresponds to it. So maybe we have hospital admissions to the, um, to the non-ICU uh, hospital admissions. And that would correspond to kind of this, this flow plus this flow together constitute in the model a per day amount of non-ICU hospital admissions. This is not the neonatal intensive care unit. This is non-ICU. Non um, so the sum of these um, for a given particle, each particle, remember, has a certain number of people here at each point in time. And so these flows would have certain values for that particle. And we can total those up. Um, people per day coming into the non-ICU hospital, and we can compare that against empirical data uh, in the likelihood function. And same thing with people coming into the ICU. And same thing with people being diagnosed. That's what these kind of flows are, and these flows, and these flows. Um, this, this sort of uh, whatever it is, tan flow or whatever. Um, um, uh, so, so each quantity in the model needs kind of, each quantity of data we want to compare to, needs something in the model that corresponds to it. So if you want to compare, um, if you want to leverage data on deaths, for example, you'll need, you'll need to somehow represent a death flow in your model. If you want to, if you have data from the world that represents uh, wastewater concentrations, you need something in your model that could be used to deduce what the concentration of wastewater is. If you have data from the world that represents test positivity, you need something in your model that's characterizing test positivity so that each particle has at a given time, given its understanding, its belief about the state of the world, it's predicting a certain test positivity and you can compute a likelihood that that test positivity in the true situation would produce what's observed for the world. So we need these kind of um, correspondences. And wastewater concentrations is one of these. And we, we, we have for those um, variables characterizing the shedding population. Those are not shown here, but um, I'll be by request, I'll be talking more about those later. Um, so, you know, we have this very sophisticated compartmental model. It's been used again for, for all these different provinces, for nine of the provinces multiple times, for FNIB and for PHAC for First Nations reserves and for others, as, as well as for um, Saskatchewan and then on occasion for, for municipalities, et cetera. Um, and um, each particle is a certain state vector. And what's important is that there are certain parameters that are adjusted here dynamically. They're evolving dynamically over time. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, they're engaging in random walks. Now, for some people, the light bulb will go off and you realize, oh, he's talking about a Brownian man random walk. For some people, that would be opaque. Um, a random walk is, is formally something where they're kind of wandering about in, a, um, uh, in an undirected way. Um, they have a certain equal chance of going up or going down according to a draw from a normal distribution uh, over time. And uh, sometimes it's the actual value of the parameter, sometimes it's a transform, you know, the log of it that can go up and down in this sort of way. So like contacts per day, um, um, or actually this is effective contacts per day, mumble, but basically the log of that, so this is something that's zero or more, or zero, and it can be anything more than zero. So to allow it to wander over an unrestricted area, um, you take the log of it and you have that wander up and down. ODE stands for ordinary differential equation, sorry. So th these are called ODEs, uh, ordinary differential equation. It's basically saying the rate of change of this is equal to that, rate of change of that. And for those not familiar with this, this may look scary, but it, it turns out it's fairly mechanical to figure out how to go from something like this or go from something like this um, into, into those so-called ODEs, ordinary differential equations. They'd also be called an example of a, of a state equation. Um, um, yeah, that, that'd be another uh, way, to, way to say it. Um, 
and I could be more precise mathematically by mumbling things about, you know, um, stochastic or first, first order um, ordinary differential equations, mumble, but, um, um, or stochastic um, uh, first order differential equations, but I, I won't engage in too much mumbling with that. So each of these evolves over time. Um, uh, and um, for example, we have some parameter involved the efficacy, how effective active testing is at body people. If we open a mass testing site, how, how effective that is at body people, and then some reporting fractions and contacts per day. Um, is the compartmental model the same as the system dynamics model? Yes. Um, yes, I would, I would count system dynamics models as um, a subclass of, of compartmental models. Um, why do I say a subclass? Um, uh, so I'll switch back from this to, to sort of direct this point. Um, so within dynamic modeling, there are these different classes of dynamic modeling tradition. The three major ones I outlined, but when I outlined them, I actually made I engaged, I exhibited some mumbling and um, some people may not have noticed it, but um, um, I said, you know, system dynamics slash compartmental models. Um, and uh, I sort of prevaricated a little bit and I said agent based slash micro simulation models. I didn't say slash, but I said that, you know, they're, they're really close cousins of or very cognate to micro simulation models. And I said discrete about simulation models. Um, the, the truth is, um, Compartmental modeling and system dynamics modeling, mathematically, um, uh, most compartmental models are, are used in an ODE fashion, and the same is true of, of, of system dynamics models. And mathematically, they're basically the same class of models, the same formalism. But system dynamics is a philosophy of modeling that goes beyond compartmental modeling. And it includes um, qualitative models like causal loop diagram or model mapping techniques that's used in a participatory fashion include system structure diagrams as well as stock and flow diagrams. Um, it, it, it has graphical components. It emphasizes stakeholder participation. Um, and it's kind of a philosophy for conceptualizing, understanding, capturing and refining um, and managing complex systems. Um, uh, through focus on feedbacks and accumulations. Compartmental modeling tends to be a more mathematically rooted tradition that doesn't have as much philosophical baggage associated with it. Um, and and, it, and it's, it's often used in more what it's called closed form analysis. So essentially you're figuring out like the long-term behavior of this or the stability of the system um, it's, it's robustness. If, you know, you had a hundred people drive in on a bus with COVID-19, would it take off in that city? Um, uh, you, you're figuring out how certain, um, how the long-term behavior, like the amount of COVID-19 that's going to be circulating depends on certain features of the system, um, certain parameters. It tends to be very mathematically based and, and it can be pursued with compartments which have other semantics like delay differential equations, et cetera. But they're very, very close. And, and most modeling done with system dynamics and most modeling done with compartmental models are using the same formalism. It's just system dynamics has this philosophical perspective and, and sort of a practical perspective about how to model. And the focus of attention of modeling is more assuredly on the feedback structure, which tends to get and a lot of compartmental modeling sort of rushed under the rug. It comes from more of an engineering perspective and, and to some degree now management science perspective. Um, the, the, the feedback focus and the, and the accumulation focus. So system dynamics has a lot of kind of particular perspective on how to go about compartmental modeling, which most compartmental modelers don't adhere to. Agent-based modeling and micro simulation um, are two different individual level traditions that have a huge amount in common. But again, they come from different lineages. Agent-based modeling a lot has come out of computer science and in mathematical physics to a degree. And, um, um, and 
it it has a focus on on uh, agent uh, agent agent interactions and evolution of emergent behavior from agent agent interactions. Um, agent based modeling does um, agent environment interactions, uh, et cetera. Uh, Whereas micro simulation model tends to come out of social sciences and um, particularly economics and tends to have a more atomistic, in my view, view where um, we're not so much focusing on agent agent interactions, we're, we're simulating a person's evolution over the life course, maybe in some nonlinear ways, but there's less focus on how they interact with others or with the environment. It's more kind of focus on each one in particular. So a lot of micro simulation models just take each person in the population, run it forward, e next person, run it forward, next person, run it forward. It's not simulate the evolution of the population together, you know, as they evolve and interact, which is central in, in agent-based modeling. So there are some of my close colleagues and friends out there who will say, you know, like agent-based modeling and micro simulation are the same thing, but they're actually, two rather different lineages and traditions that kind of make use of the same formalism, but often approach it quite differently. Also, micro simulation tends to focus a lot on statistical um, formulations of how people evolve over time using observables. It, it's applied a lot in things like StatsCan um, with, with ModSim and uh, ModGen mod and, and, um, and, and it's, sort of result in an onco-sim, et cetera, tends to have um, more of a, a focus on observables, whereas agent-based modelers, like from computer science and physics background, are dealing often with the mechanisms, and they're less, they're less um, beholden to the observables. Um, uh, but a lot of micro-simulation is done in, you know, um, U.S. Department of Commerce and, and, and to study pension policies worldwide and assess, assess um, um, government, uh, government interventions and transfer effects, et cetera. Um, and so are they the same? Are they different? I tend not to get into these things about drawing boundaries because I think it tends to change a lot um, uh, over time and, and you know, you say this and, and it evolves in a different way. And it, I, I don't know, I, I don't have a dog in the fight, but um, um, fundamentally there's different traditions that make use of similar formalisms, both over in compartmental and system dynamics and in, in microsim and, and ABM. And um, that's worth bearing in mind because they will have often different conferences and different literatures and different sociology and different, um, um, uh, validation procedures and different levels of comfort with certain types of models and different publication venues and 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 you know you'll find a modeler from one tradition and often they end up critiquing the others without having the authenticity of ever practicing them and and that gets problematic. Um, no, so I'm glad to talk about these things and I could hold forth for for longer, but I don't want to bore you with 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 all these things. But I'm I'm glad to talk more about them. the sociology of modeling is is interesting, and unfortunately, there's still a lot of tribalism out there, propagated by people who have no authenticity in other traditions and who judge other traditions by the standards of their own tradition and the goals of their own traditions. These traditions often differ, often differ as much in their goals as they do in their formalisms. Um, I showed you those three different types of modeling traditions about how they characterize the state of the system and its evolution over time, and it looks rather different. And people tend to sort of pay attention to that because it's the obvious difference. But what's the more profound difference is the different questions they ask. Um, they ask often different questions. They're used to pursue different goals. You'll find a lot of system dynamics modeling being used to bring diverse sets of stakeholders together to come to common understanding and common mental models and to kind of, um, it's the goal of the model is to bring people together to, um, uh, to, to, you know, engage in fruitful dialogue and so on. And if you hold that up and you judge against the standard of an agent-based model, you'll get all tied up in knots because it, it's not the same goal. Um, and the same thing with a micro simulation model. So you, sometimes you get them talking at cross purposes. Well, a lot of the time you do. 
but this is a generational thing. And as younger generations are coming in, there's more openness to crossing these boundaries and, um, and using multiple lines of, of work. Um, anyway, I um, hope, hope those comments are helpful. Um, so uh, we're not gonna go on too long with this, um, uh, with this um, part one of this, but um, so we have these, um, we have these uh, parameters which are evolving over time. And um, a key component of this are these likelihood functions. What is a likelihood function give? Well, look, for a given particle, a given particle has a certain belief right now, how many people are here, 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 and here, and here, and so on. And again, I, there's, there's no you know, funny business here. At a given time, for a given particle, it has a certain number of people who are in the infectious early early stage symptomatic state, certain number, a particular number of people here in the late stage symptomatic state. Particle at a given time is a certain number of people for each of these states. It is a state vector. Mm. Um, and uh, each of these parameters at any one time will have a value. It will just be wandering over time or a transformed version that will wander. A likelihood function, given a particle's belief right now, will we'll say, what's the likelihood of observing a certain set of observations right now? Like a certain number of cases, um, persons tested, persons testing positive, deaths, hospital admissions, people overnight in the hospital and, and with the ICU, and maybe a certain value for wastewater data. Um, we'll be dealing separately with wastewater by, by or I'll be talking specifically about that in a later lecture by, by request. And so a likelihood lets a particle say, hmm, given my understanding of the world, how likely is it that I would observe what's actually been observed in the world? Mm. And we have different forms of these distributions. Most commonly, we multiply these together, um, uh, these ones together. Um, yeah, Hind is. I think is on to something there with the uh, the statisticians, um, and um, and so a given overall likelihood is like a multiplication of likelihoods with respect to certain things. So each of these sub likelihoods will say like this will be for census. It will compare the model's belief for how many people are in census, meaning meaning how many people are in the in the ICU overnight at midnight compared to what's actually observed. Um, and this one will be comparing the hospital wards, how many people are in there overnight and uh, night compared to what's empirically observed. And each likelihood will be, um, will draw in certain distributions. So it might be drawing a log normal distribution or a negative binomial or Poisson or a normal or what have you. Um, because this is just the intro lecture, I won't go into it in detail, but these are negative binomial ones, which we found to be very, very handy and sort of our workhorse for most cases of reporting for various reasons. I can talk about those reasons in a more, um, in, in a subsequent lecture, but um, negative binomials tend to be more robust than, um, uh, than like a, a binomial one, for example. Um, more robust if, all the part of, because it, it tends to have um, a lot less chance that, that you'll get a zero likelihood back. For example, if um, the empirical data is, is um, greater than um, the positive model value. And if that happens for all particles, they all say likelihood zero, then bad things happen. And, and you know, modelers are made sad and so on. Um, Okay, so at each observation, we update a particle's weight by the likelihood. Let's, let's go talk about this. Here we have a particle, particle one, particle two, particle three. And in general, there'll be hundreds of thousands of these for our models, uh, for our big COVID-19 models. Fewer for other models, we might have thousands for other models, fine. Each particle will have a weight before the observation occurs. It will have some pre-existing weight. And each particle has a, a state vector. Each particle has a certain belief about how many people are here and here and here and here and here and here. We can list that out in this vector form. This is maybe the number susceptible, number in E, number in IA, et cetera. Um, and, and these green ones are just 
the ones that evolve stochastically. I mean, they're no different. We just sort of highlighted them differently. Um, uh, they're all just numbers, right? Particle two is a different belief about the world. It believes there are 495 susceptibles, or P1 says, nah, there's 902. Um, and P3 says, um, uh, no, there's 992. You folks are out to lunch. Um, OK, these are the particles. Each particle has a certain belief about the world right now, at this time. OK, and, and then because it has a belief about the world, it believes well, there should be these many cases of new infection. There should be this hospital census coming from this. If that's, if that's what you believe, if you believe a certain number in here, you have some prediction for how many people are becoming infectious each unit of time. You know, um, you have some belief about how many are hospitalized per unit of time. Um, so, so each of these particles has some belief about you know, the number of people should be in the hospital census or number of people are getting, you know, presenting for um, um, sick. And, and, but we also have data from the world about those things. And so each particle's, observe, each particle's um, belief about the, what these should be can be compared with the corresponding data from the world. And we can compute a likelihood, right? We could say, how likely is it if there's 12 actual endogenous cases, if, if the model believes there should be 12, and we actually see 10, what would be the likelihood of observing 10 instead? We can associate a number with that. That's what this likelihood things do. Um, so we're saying the value of um, this um, mumble, it's, it's this one, I think, this ICU, the hospital, uh, hospital census here. If, if the model thinks there should be 20 and they're actually 15, um, this would be the likelihood of observing 15 if there's 20, based on the likelihood function we choose. Um, and again, I showed a, a, a negative binomial one as one common example. It's our, our workhorse for those uh, case-related ones, not, not, um, not for wastewater, for example. Um, and, and the same thing to be done for particle two. You know, particle Particle one has done pretty darn well here. You know, it expected 12 case presentations. Um, we actually see 10 empirically, but you know, it's not too far off. It is a likelihood of it's 0.22 with the likelihood function. And this one maybe um, you know, 0.75. It expected 20, it saw 15. Um, um, and plugging that into those two into the likelihood, maybe we get 0.75. P2, um, it predicted. 15 endogenous case presentation. We only saw 10, uh, oh, mumble. Um, um, so uh, mumble, this should be actually smaller. Um, okay, well, um, okay, I won't, I, won't, uh, I won't try to correct that right now. This should be smaller than 0.22. Um, it, it only expected two people in hospital census and we saw 15 and so that's really less likely. So each of these particles could have a likelihood computed for each of these sub likelihood functions. Mm. And then we multiply them together to get this composite likelihood um, uh, or composite likelihood. Um, and, uh, and then um, we multiply that times the weight, the existing pre-existing weight, 0.2, to get an updated unnormalized weight. And then we normalize the weights. And that's all. Um, uh, that's the weight update. So what have we done? We've taken the weight of the particle, which reflects kind of its credibility, how much credence we put into this for this particle, how frequent it is in the distribution in more crunchy terms. And we um, update it with the likelihood by multiplying it by the likelihood. In other words, we say, okay, so before this observation, you had a weight of 0.2. Um, um, now, how did you do with this observation? And based on that likelihood, you know, I'm going to update your weights. I'm going to upweight you or downweight you accordingly. Um, and the same thing with this particle, the same thing with this particle. So we, we just sort of updated our understanding of the credibility of this particle based on how well it stacked up, its predictions stacked up 
against these observations. Okay, and mm, this is um, uh, this is something which then gives an updated set of weights, which um, uh, are um, reflect you know its credibility in light of the latest particles as as we understand it, and then resampling could occur here where we we have the judgment day and we multiply things with high um, high weight and we um, uh, we have things that with low weight disappear and middle weight you know it's it's a multinomial draw from these for for those for and that's a that's a, a statement you recognize um, so it draws from these with a probability proportional to its weight um, in a, in, in, um, and so you might have many of these represented and a few of these, et cetera. It's a probabilistic process. And that's our resampling, our survival of the fittest. Okay, so um, I wanna break now for lunch, but uh, let, me, let me give a, a summary here. Um, what we saw here might look, you could be excused for thinking that this is a curve fitting process. You know, or something like this, that we're somehow fitting this curve. Um, we're just matching the model up to what we see. You could be excused for thinking that, but it would be grossly uh, mistaken. Um, this is not a curve fitting process. They're asking instead, what is this data from the world telling me about what's going on in the underlying situation? When I talk about the underlying situation, I'm talking about this model of it, you know, how many people are here, 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 here. It's interpreting this data from the world, you know, and, and asking what is it telling us about what's going on here, including these stochastically evolving parameters to capture our humility with the model. In fact, we can't predict everything. Um, and there may be, in fact, stochastics going between these different compartments, these different stocks, these different levels. Um, that's what's, um, uh, that's what's going on. It's not fitting the curve. No, no, no. It's interpreting an observation of what's going on in the world, these observations. We're updating our understanding of the underlying situation in a way that it's most consistent with what we see empirically. Um, um, but it's always consistent with the theory captured by the model, recognizing there's some wiggle room with the theory because of stochastics. The model seeking to identify a coherent understanding consistent with you know, the, the understanding of the situation in terms of broad theory, this sort of broad natural history of infection, et cetera, um, um, that's, that also makes sense of this data. So we're using data about the world on an ongoing basis to inform this theory, to reground this theory, recognizing we have humility because the model is not, bullheadedly saying, this is the way things have to be given the state, this is what will happen. And saying, this is the, you know, the general tendency of what will happen with stochastics. So it's taking all this data from the world and updating our understanding. Just as when we're walking along that sidewalk with our eyes closed, we're not sure where we are. And then we open our eyes and we suddenly see, even if it's a fog around us, we suddenly see features and now we know much better where we are. Um, we see that glowing, you know, front of the of the store of the restaurant. We see, you know, that familiar stop sign or whatever, and we know now. Okay, that's where we are. Um, uh, so, um, but it's it's a, it's mapping us to where to our mental model to a place in our mental model. Oh, we're near that intersection. That's what's going on here. We're mapping these data from the world to an understanding about this underlying situation consistent with this kind of um, theory is captured by this structure. Um, and this process involves inference from the observed data in a way therefore which squares with our, our sort of theory is captured by the model with wiggle room with that theory, with recognition that the theory is incomplete and um, has its, its limitations. Um, uh, but once we've done that, we can take this model and we can project forward um, with or, or without interventions. Um, you know, in other words, we can take this model, project it forward from now, 
just as Xiaoyan will be talking about in her talk, project forward and see what's, what's coming up, for example. So having grounded it over here, having you know, beliefs about how many susceptibles there are, how many infectives, how many recovered. Now we're in a much better position to project forward. And she'll be talking about a set of experiments she did with this, this model and a pertussis model doing exactly, exactly that. So the empirical data here, we're not fitting to it like little bit by little bit and just kind of doing a linear progression forward. No, 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 no. We're regrounding our understanding of the underlying situation, much as, as if we open our eyes on that sidewalk. And then that gives us a sense of what's coming up. That gives us a sense of what's happening. That's much more confident, even if we close our eyes right now, for the next you know, um, 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters, we'll be much more confident about where we are because we got that glimpse. We can project forward with much greater confidence and we can ask what if questions with much greater confidence, um, you know, about uh, if we altered uh, the situation. So we're not projecting forward curves here. No, no, no. We're projecting forward the kind of natural momentum of the system, you know, its state of the system as, it, as we capture it in the model. We're projecting that forward according to the factors that govern the model. Um, no data arrives through that forward projection. We're projecting into the you know, projecting right now immediately what will happen over the next, you know, month. We don't see the data over the next month. That hasn't existed yet. But we, we, we have used the regularities of the system plus our regrounding of where we're at to sort of project forward. And you can imagine how valuable this is when you can do this every day. And that's what we did through the pandemic. Every day, our model will get new data in. You know, ideally, it would be wastewater data as well as health system data, although the wastewater data wouldn't be available, um, you know, on every day, and it wasn't available through the first part of the pandemic, and uh, it could be ingested. We update our interpretation of all those states by upweighting particles that are more consistent, downweighting those, and, and, and then project forward, and um, model can do it. Pretty good job, pretty good job anticipating ICU demand or, or hospital demand or cases or, or you know, evolution of, of the um, number of undiagnosed people, et cetera, using this by leveraging all this data from the world to, to give a joint portrait of what's the underlying situation, much as that CAT scan machine by taking photos from all different angles can give us a 3D portrait of the person being imaged. That's, that's the picture, that's the intuitions. And uh, after lunch, um, uh, we're going to be uh, having a, uh, an example a talk by Xiaoyan. Um, we're a bit behind, but uh, we'll do it after an hour lunch. Um, talk about uh, one of her half dozen or so applications of this, um, one of her earliest and one that forms her outstanding master's thesis, um, uh, simply, simply incredible master's thesis. Maybe I'll finish by answering one question which came up here. Um, how to determine optimum number of, of likelihood uh, processes? Previous slide where you have to form the overall likelihood is the sum, they're actually multiplication of sub likelihoods, but yeah, it's a, it's a um, uh, to many are, are parsimonious. Yeah, um, this is a very good question. This is a deep question. Um, we have indeed found through some of our exploration, particularly the particle and CMC models, that um, sometimes with particle and CMC in particular, it can be, you, you do well to, to think carefully about whether to add another term into the likelihood function. Um, with particle filtering, we've generally found extra terms to be pretty advantageous for the performance. Um, but with particle on CMC, we found it more variable. It, it can really hit something called the acceptance rate, which we'll talk about then. Um, but um, uh, uh, you know, one thing that I know my statistician colleague, Jushin Liu talks about is, you know, that there may be shortcomings of just multiplying these likelihood functions, um, these sub-likelihood functions. Maybe you want to have 
a joint likelihood that takes into account multiple types of data instead of just parceling it out to the product of likelihoods each with respect to a certain sphere of data. Um, she's expressed, you know, some belief that that we could probably do better by not separating it out always like that. And um, I can't say that we've thoroughly experimented with this, but if Jushin says that, I tend to believe her. Um, she is absolutely incredible as a statistician. And, and I think we have some, some research to do um, on that, um, you know, to, to better understand, could we uh, craft better likelihood functions in one that, that doesn't just take a complex one with many factors into a product of, you know, with respect to each factor. I think we can, we can do better uh, for that. And um, we have found with particle MCMC again, that choosing the form of that likelihood um, can make a real difference. That's certainly true with using negative binomial instead of binomials. It can be much better for negative binomial for certain reasons with the cases, but, but we also compared things like a gamma distribution and a log normal distribution um, um, and, and uh, I believe normal and, and maybe other sorts uh, for wastewater and we found real, real differences. Um, um, so, um, I, you know, in general, I think more data types you have, the more information that's helping give this triangulated picture. Um, the more, remember that, that analogy I gave to that Norwegian army manual, it said, if, if the map disagrees with what you see around you, believe your eyes. Um, um, it's kind of like having more peaks around you from which you can triangulate your view. If you have more types of data, you get a better bearing on where you are that points you more and more consistently to an interpretation. In general, I think having those additional types of data is useful, but I think how to jointly leverage them, I think there's some great advances that could be, a, could be um, put into place there. And I think we're just, you know, um, you know, tapping the basics right now. Um, uh, but we're doing very well with it. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm very pleased with, with the results and what Shayan accomplished um, together with uh, Lu Jie Duan and, and others during the pandemic with this, you know, um, doing daily reporting for all the 17 different jurisdictions we had reporting for, going on for um, across Canada. Um, uh, that, that that's really just incredible work and it added such insight as to the current situation and where it was likely to evolve to inform the uh, decision making. Um, very, very effective and more effective and more robust than other techniques. Okay, um, I think we'll, we'll stop there. Thank you for the questions as always. Thank you for your patience. We'll break for an hour and uh, then we'll uh, get going for uh, an application example here. Um, so. Thanks very much and uh, look forward to seeing you after lunch and um, uh, we'll hear from um, uh, the exceptional, um, uh, the exceptional experience that uh, Xiao Yan Li has, has developed in this area. Thank you so much. Take care there. And, and I'll close the session so we can get the, uh, the, the videos processed. Thank you very much. Take care.